Thank you very much. I'm glad it worked out um, finally. So the title of my talk is Genome and Transcriptome Dynamics in Cancer Cells. Um, to start, the most important slides, the member of my laboratories who in different capacities contributed to what I'm going to talk about. We have active collaborations. The University of Lübeck, the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, and the University of Göttingen, which is part of a clinical research unit which is funded by the um, uh, German research um, community. So what I will do is um, at the first third or half of my talk discuss with you what we know about chromosomal changes and patterns of aneuploidy in carcinomas, essentially as part, uh, as, as kind of an introduction to uh, the second topics uh, when we, I discuss briefly what the consequences of these cytogenetic abnormality, abnormalities are on the transcriptome, on the gene expression in cancer cells. And then I will exploit what we can do in order to translate what we have learned from these more basic um, um, research topics to uh, um, translational medicine, both in terms of uh, genomic aberrations and alterations of the transcriptome. What you see here are chromosomes from a patient with chronic myelogenous leukemia. And you can see there is a single chromosomal translocation between chromosome 9 and 22. And at this point, I have to pause and acknowledge Janet Rowley, who actually discovered the balanced nature of this chromosomal translocation. In fact, this slide was performed in a collaboration with her. She unfortunately passed away just two months ago. She was a staunch pro um, uh, supporter of the intramural research program in general and the Genome Institute in particular, where she served as a scientific advisor since its inception. And as you know, this translocation has profound effects, not only in terms of diagnosis, but for treatment, because if you target the genetic event, which is the fusion of BCR and ABL, which results in aberrant tyrosine kinase signal with a drug, you can get these patients into remission. And the paradigm of chrom uh, balanced chrom uh, chromosomal translocation not only applies to CML, but to many other um, hematological malignancies as well, which some of them are listed here. But I chose to show you this slide for another reason as well, which is clearly there is one genetic event which we now co uh, causes transformation, but you can also appreciate that the rest of the genome remains normal. So what it is that there is a single genetic event which is sufficient to transform these hematological cells. If you look at solid tumors, carcinomas in particular, tumors of epithelial origins, the picture changes dramatical, dramatically. Here is a normal karyotype, and here is, uh, are the metaphases from a breast cancer cell in SKBR3. And you can see profound degree of chromosomal instability, not only numerically, but also structural. Then you can see giant marker chromosomes, which are a reflection of oncogene amplification, in this case, the CMIC and the HER2 new oncogene. Then you have other features, this is probably a little dark, in cancer cells, which we call aneuploidy, which is reflected in enormous degree of variability in the DNA content from one cell to another. You can also appreciate apolar mitosis, which clearly will lead to chromosome uh, to a different chromosome count in these cells, you can see the phenomenon of anaphase, which, is, which results in lost chromosome and is caused by telomere attrition. So pictures like this and this led to the perception that if you look at most solid tumors in adults, it looks like someone set off a bomb in the nucleus. And this perception led to the interpretation that in solid tumors, different from the hematological malignancies, we have a cytogenetic chaos, which is induced by catastrophic mitosis. You have seen one. Karyotypic complexity, heterogeneity of the tumor cell population, and ongoing chromosomal instability. 
And the perception of a cytogenetic chaos also led to the perception that chromosomal aberrations in solid tumors, different from the hematological malignancies, would rather be a consequence, ra uh, would be a consequence rather than the cause of the disease. And what I will show you now is, uh, I will discuss with you now whether this is indeed the case. Um, arguably, we had to develop um, uh, methodologies to dissect the complex aberrations in solid tumors. Most important was uh, comparative genomic hybridization. I will show uh, more details later. But in short, it allows you to map genomic imbalances in the entire tumor cell population. We have spectral karyotyping, which we developed uh, years ago, which allows you to paint all chromosomes in different colors. And then we can use specific probes to uh, uh, enumerate chromosomal copy numbers directly in non-dividing cells, cytological preparations or tissue sections. And it can also be used to, to uh, identify translocation because you see a fusion of different colors. And now with the advent of global gene expression profiling or sequencing, we can interpret and query how these aberrations affect the gene expression levels on a global uh, in, in a global uh, sense. So having had these tools, we then try to understand the, di the dynamics of changes in the, trans in the, in the tra transition from normal epithelium to invasive disease. And initially, we turned to two model systems, which is cervical carcinogenesis, colorectal carcinogenesis, mainly for the reason because the morphological changes are very well described and they are accessible. So we, it, 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 you know the sequence. It goes from low-grade dysplasia to high-grade dysplasia and eventually to invasive disease. And while it looks a little different in the colon, it's, it's the same. You have premalignant lesions that if they would be removed, you would treat, you would cure the patients. So we asked, uh, we used a combination of molecular cytogenetic tissue microdissection techniques, gene expression profiling, and asked the question, is there a non-random distribution of chromosomal changes in any one of those different tumor entities? Is there a stage-specific sequence of events? In other words, are some changes early, others late? And which additional genetic or epigenetic ch changes do occur? And it is now completely clear that the distribution of chromosomal gains and losses is non-random. In red, you see the aberrations for the cervix. Let's just look at chromosome 3. On the right side are the gains. On the left side are the losses. Chromosome 5 has gained. But the rest of the genome is relatively unaffected. In the colon, which is displayed in green, you can see invariably gains of chromosome 7 extra copies of the long arm of chromosome 8, chromosome 20, and very specific and unique for colorectal tumor genesis gains of chromosome 13. And I just want to point out, we, we, we and others have now studied more than 500 cases of cervical carcinomas here. The blood is normalized for 10. And you can appreciate that all cervical carcinomas have a, extra copies of the long arm of chromosome 3. In other words, this aberration is as common as is the Philadelphia chromosome in CML. We do know that we have risk factors, of course, high risk uh, HPV, most commonly 16 and 18, which is required for cervical cancer to occur, but is not sufficient. And in colorectal uh, uh, tumors, you know uh, that uh, inflammation, uh, is also, uh, colitis, also uh, uh, Crohn's disease, greatly increases the risk for colorectal tumor, tumors to occur. But the distribution in these conditions is the same as in sporadic tumors. Conclusion, we do not have a cytogenetic chaos, but we have a stability on a different plateau of copy number changes. It's like a speciation. So, but we do have the problem that we have an enormous degree of variability. So the question comes up, how can we reconcile <coughs> excuse me, aneuploidy 
and ongoing chromosomal instability, which is a fact, with a strictly conserved pattern of genomic imbalances that we observe. And in order to answer this question, uh, we uh, engaged in a collaboration with the uh, um, uh, Navy at that time across street, across two streets from here, um, and collected patient samples where we have ductal carcinoma in situ and invasive ductal carcinoma on the same slide. And from that, we used tissue microdissection and we prepared from both of these lesions, independent slides where we had these single cell suspension here, you see, uh, for one case, the histology. And then we chose, we looked at the distribution of genomic imbalances that it's specific for breast cancer. You can again appreciate that it's specific, but it's different from both colon and cervix. And we chose probes, fish probes, fluorescence in situ hybridization, to enumerate a copy number of these regions together with control probes directly on these cells that we prepared from uh, DCIS and IDC. And that was done, this is a technical detail in repeat hybridization, but at the end of the day, we could enumerate 10 independent loci on many of these cells that were on the slide and were prepared from DCIS and synchronous IDC. And we don't have to go through here in, in detail, but that allowed us to enumerate in the entire population of the cancer um, copy number gains for a certain chromosome and copy number losses for a certain chromosome. And here you can see there are many cells that have the same pattern. And this is a DCIS and this is a synchronous IDC. You can appreciate that here we have a major pattern that is recapitulated in the invasive component. But you can also appreciate that we have an enormous degree of heterogeneity. In some instances, the clone that was predominant in the DCIS actually disappeared in the IDC. And um, together with our colleagues from NCBI and in the collaboration, very fruitful and pleasant collaboration with uh, Russell Schwartz, Carnegie Mellon, we then could reconstruct the dynamics that occurred from the transition from DCIS to invasive disease. And two pathways occurred. One was clonal stability. Here you can see the DCIS on the left and the IDC on the right. You can see the major clone, which is defined by these copy number orations, prevailed and was also found in this component. And here as well, and in this case, it was the same. But much to our surprise, we also noted that in some cases, the entire population of, copy of clones that were present in the in pre-invasive disease disappeared. Only those that acquired extra copy of the MYC oncogene made it to invasive disease. And that, again, uh, uh, told us that um, uh, the, the, the trans transition from pre-invasive disease in many cases is determined by the acqui acquisition of extra copies of the c -MIC oncogene. But you can also appreciate that in many cases the ductal carcinoma in situ are already governed by an enormous degree of chromosomal instability. Therefore, um, uh, in a, in a, the, the, I'm, I'm not a, a clinician. But I just cannot see that any other intervention than surgery um, would remove these uh, clones. But anyway, despite this chromosomal instability, if we then look at all these uh, clones that we have um, analyzed in copy number changes, we can conclude that chromosome 1Q, which is frequently gained, is very rarely lost. And chromosome 8Q, MYC oncogene, which is frequently gained, is very rarely lost. And those chromosomes here, P53, for instance, which is frequently lost, is rarely gained, despite this enormous degree of chromosomal instability. And this makes it then consistent with the genomic imbalances that are specific for copy number changes. So despite chromosomal instability, what is the, the the pressure for Darwinian selection is the maintenance of the genomic copy number changes that are the defining features for any one of those carcinomas. This now, of course, 
triggers the question. So we have these changes, mostly whole chromosome arms, or in other instances, whole chromosomes in the colon, gain of entire chromosome 7. This now triggers, I think, a fundamental question. How does it affect the transcriptome? You could ask the question, well, you could uh, test the hypothesis. The expression of all or most genes located on a chromosome is affected by chromosomal gain or loss. Or the expression of only a few genes whose reduced or increased expression is critical for tumor genesis is the target of chromosomal aneuploidy doing tumor genesis, and this was not clear. And in order to identify, uh, so it, the, the conclusion so far, chromosomal aneuploidies are a defining feature of carcinomas. The distribution of genomic imbalances is cancer specific to an extent that you, have, you don't have to have any other information but the distribution of genomic imbalances to say it's a cervical carcinoma or a colorectal carcinoma. Specific genomic imbalances occur before the transition to invasive disease, which is very important if you want to convert that to a diagnostic test, which I will show you later. And as I said before, there is no cytogenetic chaos, but a stability on a different plateau of genomic copy number changes. Um, so, as I said, we then ask, what are the consequences of chromosomal aneuploidy of the transcriptome, which I will discuss briefly in the next few slides, and then I will turn uh, to how we can use this knowledge to improve the diagnosis of cancer and premalignant lesions. So in order to address the question, what are the consequences on the transcriptome, we use the, an old technique, uh, which is called microcell-mediated chromosome transfer to generate artificial chromosomal trisomies, and this is how it looks. Here we have a normal carry type, and when we do this manipulation, we can put, on, put in an extra chromosome, in that case chromosome 3, but you can see, which is now present in three copies, but you can see that the rest of the carry type is unaffected. Then we collected RNA from the control and RNA from the um, plus 3 cell and performed global gene expression profiling. Here again the control, some genes are up, some genes are down, which is what you would expect. But if you look at the, uh, at the plus 3, you can appreciate that most, if not all, genes go up in expression levels. And this, by the way, is the same if you look at the constitutional chromosomal um, trisomies uh, uh, 13, 18, 21, where this increase is also not restricted to a few genes, but uh, affects most of the genes. And interestingly, uh, on a site, uh, it's tolerated for chromosome 13, 18, and 21, because these are the gene poorest chromosomes, despite they have larger size, uh, 13, uh, of course, is larger than chromosome 20. So, aneuploidy results in the significant increase of average message levels of genes on the affected chromosomes. The degree of increase closely follows genomic copy number. Therefore, chromosomal aneuploidy is not only target a few specific genes, but result in a massive and complex, de complex deregulation of the cancer transcriptome. And just contrast that to what we see in, 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 as a consequence of the Philadelphia chromosome, where you have one aberration. Now you have um, a thousand genes that go up, and you also have to appreciate, of course, there's, there are numerous transcription factors which then in turn affect genes and other chromosomes. So it's really a massive deregulation which we have not yet understood in its complexity. Uh, this is not only the case in our model system, but also in real tumors. Here, a control, a normal DNA copy number, and this is the gene expression level, which is normal as well. But if you have copy number decreases or copy number increases, the gene expression goes down in this region, goes up in this region. It's completely clear. Um, function follows form. And this is established not only from our laboratory, but now accepted in the scientific community. To summarize, we have a normal cell, karyotypically stable. Then we have chronic inflammation, for instance, in the colon, HPV infection. We have, for whatever reasons, in the breast, hyperproliferation, or we have just a cell cycle accident. What happens then? 
that we have extra copies of a given chromosomes, chromosome, and this chromosome is tissue specific. And that can occur with or without additional mutation. The what I call nuclear aneuploidy is very low, so that there is not much difference in the DNA content from one cell to another. The trisomies affect global gene expression levels, and as you will see later, these events are the basis for clonal expansion of these early lesions. If this is not being treated, then we arrive at a cancer cell where we have additional mutations. As we know, p53 occurs relatively late in colorectal tumor genesis. We have an enormous degree of variability in the DNA content from one cell to another, but the genomic aneuploidy persists that YCGH was um, successful. As I have shown you before, what is the selective pressure is the maintenance of the specific genomic imbalances. So now, I, uh, after this uh, introduction, I want to show you how we convert that to translational applications. Um, three topics, I hope I can cover them all. Um, first, I will discuss with you the role of genomic instability in the prognosis of breast cancer. Then we look at cervical carcinoma and, if time, uh, how we use transcriptional profiling to predict treatment response in patients with rectal cancer. So breast cancers usually present in two flavors. One have a relatively stable genome, which are called diploid, and others are uh, genomically instable, have a high degree of aneuploidy. You can, if you, for a take-home lesson, this is the Washington Monument, and this is the Manhattan skyline. And many years ago, our collaborator, Gerd Auer at Karolinska, I, I was not on that paper at the time, um, um, discovered that patients who have a genomically stable tumor have a far better prognosis than patients who have an aneuploid tumor. Profound differences. And then um, in 2002, and, and, and uh, uh, as I said, well, many other papers followed. Um, Van der Weber published a paper in the New England Journal who showed that there is, by gene expression, a good prognosis signature and a poor prognosis signature. They even came to the same conclusion. And if you look at these curves, you, are, you cannot argue that they are very similar. So we try to understand the nature of that similarity and perform gene expression profiling of a set of diploid tumors and a set of aneuploid tumors. And we could easily separate the aneuploid ones from the diploid ones. And this separation was based on a signature of 12 genes, which perfectly separated, almost perfectly separated, the stable from the instable breast cancers. And then we asked the question, can we use this aneuploidy-specific gene expression signature to predict, to recapitulate the published data sets? And that worked in all instances, and the numbers are very high, with very high stati statistical significance. And then the next question was whether we can ask the prognostic signatures that were derived from these data sets to predict the degree of genomic instability in our cases. And that worked perfectly well. The Oncotype DX, which is used in, in the clinic, as you know, uh, and, uh, and the, the good prognosis signature of the Oncotype DX predicted that the tumors were deployed, and the poor prognosis signatures predicted that the tumors are aneuploid. And you could see that works very well. Even, uh, and, and the same occurred for the mama print. The good prognosis signature predicted genomic stability. The poor prognosis signature predicted aneuploidy. And uh, just on the side, uh, luminal A uh, is another gene expression signature, which is now, which you know, is associated with a good prognosis, predicted genomic stability, and the basal signature and the HER2 new signature associated with a poor prognosis, predicted genomic instability. In summary, the degree of genomic instability and gene expression signature of poor prognosis are linked. The degree of genomic instability is the major biologically determinant of poor prognosis. 
and it is not only the degree of biological uh, of of general instability if you look at a tumor cell but, but it's the fact that you have many multiple clones which um, which provide the tumor with the nim nimbleness to react to environmental challenges including therapy the next application which we developed uh, for over uh, uh, more than 10 years is the identifi identification of individual progression risk in cervical dysplasia. And here, uh, you remember what I showed you, that there is invariably a gain of chromosome 3, the long arm of chromosome 3 in cervical carcinomas. Um, uh, and this gain never occurs in normal cells. So we, we developed, in uh, collaboration with Abbott, a probe set that targets these regions. Uh, these are just control probes which help us to um, just control probes which help us to enumerate. You have the same scenario if you if you test for her to do amplification. You also use a centromere for chromosome 17 as a control. And then we applied this to co um, um, routinely collected Pap stained cervical smears. And I wanna really make the point. In cervical um, uh, cytology, the challenge is not to diagnose cancer because we all actually do not want to diagnose cancer because it's too late. We want to diagnose early lesions, which can be cured by surgery. The challenge in cervical cytology is there are two challenges. I mean, everybody can say, well, this looks different than this. And here it's actually nice. You have a normal cervical cell, which is defined by a small nucleus and a large cytoplasm. And, uh, and you can easily discern that from these cancer cells. But the distinction from here to here is much harder. Even the distinction from here to here is essentially impossible. What is even more important is that only 15% of the low-grade dysplastic lesions would progress. Therefore, would require treatment, despite the fact that about 90% of these low-grade lesions are already, already positive for HPV. So HPV does not really help. It only helps if it's negative, because then you know there won't be a cervical carcinoma. But most of them are positive, so it doesn't really help. So we argued that if all these carcinomas have a gain of uh, chromosome 3q, but none of the normal have it. And there is only a fraction of the low-grade lesions that progress and requ would require treatment that those that progress already have the aberration that defines the invasive disease. And that those 85% that would spontaneously regress are uh, cytogenetically normal. And we then explored that. And you can see here um, with this probe set for three copies, two, 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 two. This is normal. Here we have a cervical interabithelial uh, neoplasia grade 2, which is a, um, a moderate dysplasia. You can see here one, two, three copies, one, two, three copies of uh, chromosome 3q. The rest of the genome is still normal. And in some of the carcinomas, you can see clouds of 3q of the Turk oncogene, which we choose as a probe that is reminiscent of the amplification of HER2 in breast cancer. And then this is unfortunately very difficult to see. Um, uh, I come back to the, uh, what I said, it is the basis for clonal expansion. Here you can see a pap smear which was stained. We then destained it. Here a normal cell, two copies. And here we have a nest of cells which were collected. They all have three copies of chromosome 3q, but they are next to each other, meaning that they originated from each other. So once a cell has acquired three copies, that is the basis for clonal expansion. So not only do we have a, di a diagnostic test, but we also can visualize the emergence of cancer by looking at the copy number changes of that particular chromosome. We confirmed that in many different studies. It was one, uh, this was one in collaboration with Karolinska, where uh, women were uh, randomly, uh, had pap smear randomly, and uh, those that had a su suspicious pap smear then underwent colposcopy and biopsy. So we could correlate the findings on the pap smears with the histology, with a gold, stud, gold standard, and the conclusion is that the gain of 3Q, the 
human telomerase gene, which is on there, has the highest combined sensitivity and specificity for the detection of histologically confirmed high-grade lesions. And we are now conducting an even larger study to uh, extend that to low-grade lesions and to ASCUS. We conducted another study which was aimed at validating 3Q as a molecular marker of progression, which, as I showed you at the beginning, is the most important. And this is how it was done. We collected a group of patients, the numbers are now much higher, um, which were diagnosed with severe dysplasia, and before they had a low-grade dysplasia. Then we had another group of women which had the same low-grade dysplasia, but returned to normal. We had another group of women which were diagnosed despite being enrolled in an active surveillance program with uh, severe dysplasia or even carcinoma, but a pap smear before was normal, so that should not happen. So we then hypothesized that those, we, we know already these are positive, these are all negative, these are all positive, but we hypothesized that those low-grade lesions that show progression are positive for 3Q, and those that show regression are negative for 3Q. And this worked in a, essentially with a sensitivity of 100% and a specific specificity of 95%. We can discuss that later. Um, um, it's a particular feature of HPV. But you can see that the point of no return in the progression risk for individual lesion is the acquisition of the specific cytogenetic abnormality that then defines the cancer entity. Um, we also um, were expected but were a little bit shocked that in some cases where the pap smear was um, assessed as being normal and after a relatively short latency the woman was diagnosed with a carcinoma, we could detect um, extra copies in a third of the cases in the cases that were cytologically assessed as being normal. And I'm just showing you some examples here. Here there is a SIN1 lesion which regressed, two copies, two copies. So there would not have been any other treatment required. Here we have a SIN2 lesions. And you can see here, for instance, these two cells. Uh, no, no, these two cells, and they have both three copies. This lesion is progressed to high-grade dysplasia and carcinoma. And this is the case that I mentioned uh, to you before, which was assessed as being normal. But you can see you have four copies of um, chromosome 3Q in this set of cells. And again, they are next to each other, indicating that the acquisition of this aberration is the basis for clonal expansion. I shall also um, emphasize that, so <laughs> I, I talked to the, the cytologists at, uh, at Hopkins, and they come in the training program twice a year. And every time at the beginning, the wrong diagnosis go up, and then they learn a little, and it goes down because it's obviously relatively difficult to uh, unambiguously assess the morphology. And when I go to cytology meetings, there are whole days that are where they discuss on how to best repeat the reading of a pap smear to avoid false negatives. And the fact that um, it's relatively often repeated is a, an acknowledgment of the fact that an individual pap smear is relatively uh, ambiguous. But you cannot argue that there are four copies. So it's a binary, it, I mean, <laughs> you can ask your six-year-old um, to, well, probably younger, um, to, to count to four and make the statement, this is not two. Therefore, they cannot even say, make the statement, there's cervical carcinoma. They can even say, there is a woman which, whose Low-grade dysplastic lesion will eventually be an invasive carcinoma. So um, <laughs> it took us a long time to convince gynecologists and pathologists to embrace that because, I mean, the procedure for the collection of this material would not even have to be changed because 
there is now, in particular with liquid-based cytology, there is always leftover. But now, finally, Quest Diagnostic has embraced the test and is offering it uh, in its portfolio. So now I want to switch gear uh, a little bit. I, I don't know what the, what the time is. Um, I'm fine. And uh, just talk a little bit how we not only use genomic operations, but operations of the transcriptome um, and um, inject genomic information into a problem of treatment response in patients with rectal cancer. And you know that better than I do. There are many treatment options in solid tumors. It can be surgery alone, surgery plus adjuvant chemo radiation or chemotherapy in colon carcinomas, or neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy followed by surgery or other approaches. Or in some instances, depending on the morbidity of the patient, maybe chemo radiation alone. And the problem in rectal cancer is a real clinical problem because based on a large uh, study which um, was conducted uh, from the German Rectal Cancer Study Group and has been adopted now in most of Europe, I know it's not quite completely adopted in the United States, the standard treatment of locally advanced rectal cancer is neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy, mostly based 5-FU and radiation, followed by surgery and then uh, chemotherapy. And the reason for that is that they found out that if uh, pre-surgery chemoradiotherapy is administered, there is a higher rate of R0 resection, there was a higher rate of sphincter-preserving resections, and there was a reduction of local recurrences significant from I believe 14 to 6 percent. The profound clinical problem is that the response to, pre, uh, to near adjuvant chemo radiotherapy is very heterogeneous. You can have complete pathological response in that case, where after surgery there is not a single tumor cell left. Or you have essentially complete resistance, where the tumor just doesn't bother being treated with 5-FU and radiations. So we generated, uh, the, together with a former postdoc of mine, Michael Gadimi, who is now the chair of surgery at the University in Göttingen, Germany, a clinical research unit, uh, you can look it up, in order to address that problem. And we aimed at, at identifying predictors of response and identify targets of that and understand mechanisms that um, could explain this profound difference in response versus resistance. And in order to do so, we initially designed a pilot study with uh, 30 patients. Um, they all had pretreatment clinical, uh, clinical staging based on uh, rectal uh, ultrasound. We then collected tumor bios uh, biopsies and performed gene expression profiling. They obviously um, I can barely see from here. But then they uh, went to this neoadjuvant um, uh, scheme, which is chemotherapy, uh, followed by surgery and four rounds of five of you. And then we had a long-term follow-up. Uh, mm -hmm. The pa pathological staging is shown here. And as I said, we performed gene expression profiling and then evaluated local and distant recurrences after medium follow-up times of 44 months. And the gene expression profiling worked actually fairly well. Here we had, um, I forgot which, how many, there were 30 cases. Um, at, uh, approximately half of them had non-responding tumors. A uh, uh, little uh, fewer had tumors that show a complete response. And the gene expression profiling could actually fairly well discern these two groups. But then we looked at the genes that were upregulated in the tumors that were resistant. And among those were the transcription factor TCF4. And this obviously um, rings a bell because the transcription factor TCF4 is the major effector of wind signaling 
in colorectal tumor, in, 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 in of the major effect of wind signaling, of course, not only in colorectal tumor genesis. Um, and wind signaling is intricately involved in colorectal tumor genesis, which is affect uh, mutations in the adenomatosis polyposis collagen, um, um, resulted in stability of catenin, which then actually increases the expression of the transcription factor TCF4, which in turn turns on cyclin D1C MIC and other notorious oncogenes and therefore transform these cells. Um, so that was a, 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 a very interesting lead. So we hypothesized that silencing of a gene that is overexpressed in resistant tumors would increase sensitivity to chemoradiotherapy. Um, and we did this silencing uh, with the approach of using RNA interference. And I don't go uh, into details here, but if you inject small interfering RNAs into cells, you can reduce either protein synthesis or you can cleave the transcript, which results in a loss of function. And you can do that essentially for any gene of interest. So we used small interfering RNA against the transcription factor TCF4 and asked the question whether silencing of TCF4 would increase sensitivity of colorectal cancer cells to chemoradiotherapy. Here you can see the results. It was a very effective silencing here shown in the reduction of protein. We repeated that in many different, with many different constructs. And when the uh, cells were then um, uh, subjected to radiation and not shown here, but also to chemo radiation. Uh, this is a log scale. You can see here the control, and you can see here a profound sensitization uh, after silencing of the transcription factor TCF4, which in primary tumor samples was overexpressed in those that were resistant to treatment. Conclusion. Reduced expression of TCF4 leads to a sensitization to radiation. We are now exploring whether we can recapitulate this effect using small molecule inhibitors of wind signaling. And together with this clinical research unit in Göttingen, we uh, are about to design clinical trials to test that um, um, in patients. So in summary, we have performed gene expression profiling, which I have shown you um, uh, in um, rectal carcinomas um, that are resistant or sensitive to neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy. We have also queried many different levels of the genome using CGH to see whether we have specific genomic imbalances that could explain the sensitivity. We have performed microRNA expression profiling. We explored KRAS and BVF mutation, which, by the way, did not explain the different sensitivity to um, radiation. We looked at the methylation stat status. And in collaboration with Stephen Chanock, we uh, used the uh, 1 million Illumina uh, platform to look for single nucleotide polymorphism polymorphisms in the group of patients that uh, respond differentially to see, to explore whether certain haplotypes, um, for instance, in genes that are involved in drug metabolism, could explain the profound clinical uh, differences in the clinical course. We do all this in order to address the problem that all drives us, which is that patients come into the clinic with different clinical features. They have a different genetic makeup and a different tumor biology. And in the case of rectal carcinomas, they also have a different treatment toxicity. And this is not only true for rectal carcinomas, but the different genetic makeup of, for instance, premalignant lesions in the cervix would, could be summarized here. However, despite these acknowledged differences, which we do not understand to the the extent we should, all these patients receive identical therapy. The goal of all of us, of, of course, is to learn enough from all these different techniques. I have not listed next generation sequencing here, which is important as well. To learn enough about the genetic makeup so that we can assign patients to therapies from which they would benefit the most. With that, I'm at the end. 
and I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. I have one. Um, Bill Zinsky, I think, said that all of biology is only understandable by natural selection and evolution. And is it possible that by using chemotherapy, blind way, we encourage resistant tumors to grow up? I, I think it is. I, I, I think it is. I think. Um, um, I mean, tumor heterogeneity was already, I, I don't have it on this slide, um, unfortunately. But um, what we are now doing, we look at these bacterial carcinomas that are complete responders and those that are resistant and ask the question whether in those that are then resistant, there are minor clones that expand during chemo radiotherapy. So I, I think it's completely, um, completely uh, possible. Uh, but I, I can also say, I mean, it's, it's now being more and more acknowledged that we cannot think if we look at the bulk of the tumor, we have understand, understood the tumor. So this is a signal to noise question, really. Um, other comments or questions? Uh, the, question, the question was whether in, uh, let's just uh, look at cervical carcinomas or colorectal carcinomas, whether those cytogenetic abnormalities that are the early events in tumor genesis can already be detected in the adjacent normal uh, epithelium. Um, not on the chromosomal level, but we are now exploring the possibility that on those chromosomes that are early gained in any one of those diseases, that there are genes which are already higher, more highly dis uh, transcribed. So that the, the initial impetus to gain these chromosomes would be a physiological one. Um, so, but on the chromosome, normal tissue is, has no chromosomal aberrations. Compared to a normal person without cancer, is there any change no. at all? Other comments or questions? Yes. Uh, this is on um, a little, little bit on a different tangent. This is a very nice talk. Thank you. Um, what do you feel um, is the role, if any, of long non coding RNA in the maintenance of genomic stability? And sort of a consequence question is do you feel that long non coding RNA? So the, the question was, um, what is the role of non-coding RNAs, whether they are short or long, uh, in the maintenance of genomic instability? And the answer is, I don't know. Um, the answer is, uh, nobody knows. Uh, uh, obviously, the, the, through the Genome Institute and other initiatives, uh, the ENCODE project, we will learn much more about it, to hopefully through other initiatives as well. Um, and, but uh, the role of non-coding RNAs in the maintenance of the genome is not yet established. Um, from a practical point of view, um, we s there are tumor markers that I get in my office, CA125 and ovarian cancer or something like that. What does that have to do with the genetics of, of the tumor? I mean. Does that, is that an indicator that you're getting uh, increased risk of genetic uh, defects, or um, do you look at that, or it, it, it has something totally different? So the question is, uh, to which extent established um, serum markers um, would reflect the risk of developing specific um, aberrations? I, I cannot, I, I, uh, there are no study. I cannot answer that. I mean, uh, and the serum markers are, I mean, you have PSA, but, uh, but um, and, and the ovarian cancer, but it, it's, uh, there are obviously problems, and many people have looked for colon um, and, and, and other, GC pancreas, um, 
um, but there is no direct correlation. It could be, you know, also factors that are unrelated to, to um, the presence of certain genomic imbalances, which is whether you, you know, have a blood vessel that goes through the tumor and you can shed cells. So what, what I believe would be, will become um, a possibility in the future for earlier detection is um, the detection of circulating tumor cells. The reason I ask that is I have a lady with metastatic ovarian cancer who's in total remission and her scans are normal um, and she just has an increase in her CA125. So as a non-oncologist, you know, how am I supposed to deal with that or just, just let the oncologist handle it? Because I mean, she comes to me and asks me the question. I'm not going to make it such yeah. a <laughs> So can you comment on the tempo of translation of this exciting science to the clinic? Um, if I were in practice, the question I would have in my head is, is this something I'm going to have to face tomorrow, a year from now, or 10 years from now? And it seems like it's pretty soon. For, for the cervical carcinomas, it's, it's being implemented now. Um, there are several laboratories around the world who um, actually use it for um, samples that are ambiguous. Um, the, the goal would be to, to, to all the cases that are HPV positive should get this genetic test because then you know what's going to happen. And, and I, I usually restrain from uh, such statements in biology or genetics, but this is black and white. It's you have it, you progress, you don't, you do not, period. So, so this is probably the most advanced. Um, we are now, as I mentioned to you before, we, we work with the Karolinska Institute where we have 9,000 archived breast cancer cases from all of which we have the clinical follow-up. The Swedes are very good with that homogeneous population, not so much mobility. Um, um, and we have the clinical follow-up and we have the DNA content. So we, we are now in the process of, of uh, correlating in a large definitive data set the degree of aneuploidy with uh, prognostication. So that's going to be next. Um, we have just received funding in Göttingen for additional prospective trials where we can try, where we can evaluate in larger numbers um, the value of gene expression profiling for prediction of response. I recall reading a note from Dennis DeVita, who was a former director of the Cancer Institute, that we were entering a phase where in order to treat cancer, you need a very skillful doctor. And this stuff is really beginning to bring that home. Um, the pathologist isn't enough. We need more. Other comments or questions? Yes. Right now, before the age of 30, <coughs> we don't get HPV unless there's a typical cell, unless the patient's willing to pay for it. I, I did. I didn't. Un I didn't un Yeah. Is that likely going to change? Um, um, I, I know that, 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 that there were actually several studies, I, I believe, they suffered from, suffered from budget cuts and sequestration um, to exactly address the question whether HPV should be the first test. Because it essentially would make sense. Because those that are negative don't get cervical cancer. Uh, I completely agree, but I have not seen um, the result of any work. There was one out of Seattle, there was one that was initiated by Mark Schiffman at the NCI and, and others, but um, there is no... Um, I, I don't want to step on anyone's toes, but maybe there is also a priori resistance by, 
by the, the cytopathologist to, to change, or by the gynecologist to change something which has been successful. Uh, and, and I mean, one should be very careful to change something that is successful into something where you first have to validate it on a large basis. But to from a biological point, point and a genetic point of view, there would be no reason not to change the practice to what you just suggested. It is a fact that we clinicians stumble along behind <laughs> investigators and it takes a while to translate, I think. Other comments or questions? If you have them, please come down. Thank you very much. Thank you.